as a preliminary matter, this is a public meeting of the Zoning Board of Appeals. And I, uh, sorry about that. I, Howard Tracer, am chairman. Please permit me to confirm that all members and persons anticipated on the agenda are present and can hear me. Zoning Board members, Eric Svein. Yes, I'm here. Okay, Mario Carinabelli. Yes, here. And from the planning board, Larry Murphy. Here. And uh, staff, Susan Noyce. Here. And anticipated speakers on the agenda, please respond in the affirmative. Ann Martin, LEC Environmental. Yeah. Hold on. Yes, I'm here. Thank you. And Adam Costa, Town Council. I am present, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Okay, good evening. Good evening. Today is October 22nd, 2020, and it is 7.30 p.m. And this is an open meeting of the Zoning Board of Appeals, which, which is being conducted remotely consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of March 12, 2020, due to the current state of emergency in the Commonwealth due to the outbreak of COVID-19 virus. In order to mitigate the transmission of COVID-19 virus, we have been advised and directed by the Commonwealth to suspend public gatherings. And as such, the governor's order suspends the requirement of the open meeting law to have all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Further, all members of public bodies are allowed and encouraged to participate remotely. The order, which you can find posted, I'm having a little trouble with my phone, <laughs> so I'm sorry for that. Uh, the order, which you can find posted with the agenda materials for this meeting allows public bodies to meet entirely remotely so long as the reasonable public access is afforded so that the public can follow along with the del deliberations of the meeting. For this meeting, the CBA is convening by telephone conference, video conference via Zoom. As posted on the agenda of the Zoning Board of Appeals section of the town's website, identifying how the public may join in. You may participate by going to http zoom.us and entering meeting ID 898-2128-4119. And passcode 969864, or by calling 929 205 6099, entering meeting ID 898 2128 4119, and if prompted, enter passcode 969864. Please note that this meeting is being recorded and the attendees are participating by video and or telephone conference. <clears throat> Application information has been provided to the ZBA members and materials will be presented during the meeting. We now turn to the first item on the agenda. Before we do so, permit me to cover some ground rules for effective and clear conduct of our business to ensure accurate meeting minutes. I, Howard Traster, Chairman, will introduce each item on the agenda. As an attendee, we ask that you participate keeping in mind the following. Please remember to mute your phone, six to toggle mute or unmute, or computer mute button when you are not speaking. Please use earbuds or earphones with tablets and cell phones. Please remember to speak clearly and in a way that helps generate accurate minutes. Please be aware that video participants can see you and that you should take care not to screen share or allow other interruptions while you're participating on your computer. Anything you broadcast on your video will be captured by the recording. I will yield the floor to the applicant and their representatives or their representative and will allow them to present their application. If the applicant and or their representative wish to share their screen, please indicate as such so that you can be given permission to do so public comments. After the chairman has afforded the ZBA members an opportunity to speak, ask questions, the chairman will then ask for public comment as follows. I will seek questions through the raise hand function. 
For video conference, participants, this function can be accessed by clicking on the participants option listed in the menu below the photo gallery. Uh, hover your cursor in this area if you don't see it. Uh, window will open and display you on the right. On the bottom of this participant area, you will see the list of phone and video participants. And on the bottom, you will see the ability to click on a button to raise hand. Please ensure your name is displayed. Uh, list your name, address, then your question. Telephone participants can use their phone key pad while in a Zoom meeting to raise hand by hitting star nine. I will seek to call upon questions from the public that have hit the raised hand button in the order of which they are listed. Please identify your name and address and then your question or comment. Your hand will be lowered when you have been given the floor for your questions. We will continue to download the list of those in the raised hand column, should there be a physical or electronic submittal of questions or concerns that were received, they will be read for the record at this time. Uh, additional agenda items will be called upon and handled in the same manner. So, uh, Eric, could you read the agenda for tonight, please? Mute. Agenda, public hearings, Cricket Lane, LLC, 55R Pearson Drive. The applicant is requesting a comprehensive permit under General Law Chapter 40B, Sections 20 through 23, to construct the village at Cricket Lane for 24 single-family detached home ownerships units on Assessor's Map R20-0-75. Review of the wetlands portion of the comprehensive permit with Ann Martin, LEC, environmental. Okay, so uh, I'd like to start with Ann Martin from LEC environmental. Uh, whenever you're ready, Ann. So I don't know how you guys have been handling these hearings all along. I don't know whether uh, Ben Osgood has put a plan up and we followed along with his plan, or if you just want me to go item by item through my peer review memo, uh, my most recent one from October 9th. I, uh, I think you should go through your peer review okay. item by item. So everybody that's uh, listening or watching will know what you're talking about. Okay, all right. So um, I, I prepared a written peer review dated October 9th of this year, reviewing the most recent set of plans that were provided to me dated August 17th, 2020. And um, I only recapped items that I felt like were not addressed from my prior memo. So I think I'm just gonna go through this most, the second memo, the most recent one, but if something comes up that anyone wants to go back to my first memo, we can certainly do that. So running down the list, the first item was that um, I had asked them to update the site plans to depict all of the historic filling that had occurred on the property, which was not originally shown on the plans. They have updated uh, sheet three. I had asked them not, I had asked them to update all the plan sheets and um, they chose not to because they thought it would be confusing. I can understand that point. So I'm asking them to at least update plan sheets 7 and 16. That's where it shows where the historic footprint of filling extends into the footprint of the proposed roadway um, on those two sheets. And then I've commented there are some numeric problems. It's only one square foot, but there are some numeric problems with some of the information that was presented on the plans. And I, I had a little bit of a difficult time kind of tracking what they were counting as fill and what they were counting for um, wetland replication. And I just want to make sure that they are showing on the plans the historic fill and the new wetland fill and that they are providing wetland replication for all of that, including the fill 
that extends behind the existing house lot that's to the left of the entrance way. So that was my first comment. The second comment was um, I had asked them back when this was a, a prior, the first round of review, we had had discussions quite a bit about where was an appropriate location for wetland replication. And they had originally located it behind the dwelling again to the left of the entranceway when you come into the development. And that's the location where there has been historic filling and there's an existing dilapidated cinder block retaining wall right on the wetland edge where the filling had occurred. And so it doesn't didn't seem like expanding the wetland behind a house where filling had already occurred was a optimal location. And so I had asked them to evaluate looking at moving the wetland replacement area to the other side of um, the north of the DE wetland series. And they have, they have done that. Um, I have some comments on um, the planting table and some of the plant material that they picked. And they provided a table and a list of plants, but they did not provide quantities. And so quantities are really important to make sure that they meet density requirements. Um, and I attached a markup of sheet 16, just kind of telling them what my comments were. I felt like that was an easier way to present the information than to go through it in a numbered uh, written memo. And you will note that in the um, wetland replacement area, they actually must have taken a fairly close look at this area because you will see that there are three uh, trees that must be mature trees that they actually carved out and are gonna allow to remain in the area, which is, which is um, a good thing for, for many reasons related to wetland replication. They did, however, they're continuing to provide 610 square feet of wetland replacement in the backyard of the existing dwelling. So I've asked for an explanation for that because I, I, don't, I don't think they need it unless I don't understand the numbers and the math. And again, I, I don't think expanding the wetland behind that house is probably gonna prove fruitful in the long run for a wetland replacement area. In order to construct the wetland replication area north of the DE series wetland, um, they need to cross the wetland and they have selected a very narrow area, at least graphically on the plans to cross. That's gonna impact, temporarily impact 290 square feet of wetlands, but they have not provided any information about the means and methods for crossing, how they're gonna protect that wetland, what kind of vegetation is currently in the footprint of that. Uh, or any information about how that area will be restored once the replication area is created and they remove whatever means they're going to use for crossing the well. And so they need to provide that information. And then, so there's a retaining wall along the roadway where the roadway crosses the wetland, where the wetland filling is occurring at the entrance to the project, which cannot be avoided. Um, but there's 495 square feet of wetland restoration at the base of the wall. Well, after the wall is installed, they will restore the wetland, but they have, again, haven't provided any details about woody plants and seed mix or any type of performance specifications for restoration of that area. So that needs to be included. Uh, comment number six. This is a repeat comment from my April comment of this year and from comments on the prior project that was before the zoning board about the proximity of basin P32 and essentially P, uh, P12 are the next couple comments. And I had recommended that they pull back. They are very, very close to the edge of the wetland at the back of the property for this basin. Um, it varies from anywhere from three to eight feet. When I had commented on this item on the prior application, Mary Rimmer had prepared a memo which was attached to my, my first review 
where um, she had attempted to respond to my concerns about it, direct impacts that can result to the wetland when you're conducting work that close to the wetland, but it didn't really fully address my comments. And I feel like those comments still have not been addressed. Um, the applicant has indicated that, that they have pulled the basin further back, but when I take measurements with a scale on a plan, it does not appear to me that, that the distance and setback from the BBW has changed. Um, the applicant has also alluded to the fact that they would be willing to include plantings at the toe of the slope. I know that Mary's prior memo talked about actually planting the backside of the slope, but none of that has been included in the application. So that's not something that I can take into consideration. Um, so what I'm really looking for is if they're gonna offer that planting, then they need to show it on the plan. And they really need to address the concern about when you cut that close to the edge of the wetland, the kind of impacts the secondary impacts that work that close to the wetland will have on the wetland at both basin uh, P32 and a portion of basin P12. I have the same um, concern. At P12, the concern is a little bit more significant because it actually has a southern exposure. And so the, the implications and impacts due to light penetration and other things can be more substantial. That gets us to my comment uh, number 10. That's just a, that's number 10 is just a cleanup. They had proposed installing heavy duty silt fence barriers in some place, but their labeling and their graphic imaging on the plans weren't lining up, matching up correctly. That's a simple graphic item to address. Um, item number 11 is something that uh, I made in the first memo comment in April and is still there that confuses me. I don't understand why the portion of the property, I guess that they have uh, labeled 55, I only, I can't even figure out what they've labeled it, but they have, it appears that they have pulled the house lot out of the parcel, but the roadway and the historic wetland filling and still currently some of the proposed wetland mitigation is on that lot. So I don't understand how you can propose a project that's not on the piece of property. And so it seems to me like the whole property, including the portion of the property to the left of the entrance needs to be part of this application. And that concerns me because the roadway entrance is there and some of the wetland, historic wetland filling is within that footprint. So I'm hoping that someone can explain that to me. Um, I took measurements, the, the Presby system leaching beds have to be 100 feet away from the vernal pool. And I took measurements, I overlaid, uh, plan sheet nine and 11, because the plan sheet that actually shows the layout of the system does not show the 100 foot setback to the vernal pool. So I took the two plan sheets and overlaid them and the system is still at least five, it's probably 95 feet away. So they need to make some adjustments to ensure that that septic system is not within 100 feet of the vernal pool. 13 is 13 is a repeat comment. This is this is this is COVID brain. Um, number 14. Pond P1-1 is the stormwater basin to the right of the entrance when you enter the subdivision. And it's being designed as a wet pond, and which means it's going to hold water. And I um, I'm concerned about standing water for any extended periods of time on this end of the site, really on the whole site, but particularly in this area, because it is so close to where we know we have an active vernal pool and you do not want vernal pool species breeding in a stormwater basin and attracting them. So part of my question is asking why this was 
designed as a wet pond instead of an extended detention pond or why they haven't incorporated other means to meet the stormwater management standards without creating uh, standing water that stays there in the bottom of the stormwater basin. Comment number 15 um, and 16 are just about the plans indicate and the application indicates that they're going to deed land to the division of fish and game. And there is a trail system on the site that dead ends at the fish and game property. And I just, I have questions about whether or not fish and game actually uh, wants to take the land and or whether or not Fish and Game has any input on whether or not they would like a walking trail that dead ends on uh, right at their property and directs people on to their property. And that is the summary of my comments in my uh, memo number two. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. The applicant want to respond to any of Ann's comments at this point? Uh, Doug Shane would like to be unmuted. <laughs> and I will mute myself. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Ann. <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I couldn't, it wouldn't allow me to unmute. Um, um, Mr. Chairman, also um, with me this evening um, are both Ben Osgood from Ranger Engineering as well as Maureen Herald from Norse Environmental who are here to help me respond um, to uh, Ann's comments. So if uh, they could be unmuted as well, um, I would appreciate that. Um, I, I do wanna thank, um, and for her comments uh, and her review. Um, we did uh, receive them uh, late last week and immediately met with our engineers and our environmental people um, uh, earlier this week. So un unfortunately, we haven't had time to present and uh, provide a full written response uh, to the comments, uh, but we would like to just provide a, a quick overview response uh, to the comments that have been presented tonight. Uh, and we will follow up with a, a written response, which will actually include, uh, you know, some of the changes and responses that Ann has uh, asked us to do. But uh, if, if you don't mind, I will just quickly respond uh, and I will have um, uh, both uh, Ben and Maureen uh, jump in as necessary. Um, Quite frankly, some of my answers are, yes, we will do what was asked of us. So, uh, you know, forgive me for the brevity, but um, again, we would like opportunity to put things in writing. So the first comment reside, uh, regarding updating the plans to show the historic filling, uh, we will in fact provide that uh, as soon as possible. We're working on it right now. So we will update sheet seven and 16 uh, and be sure and that all of the numbers are correct down to the one, you know, the one digit you, you mentioned. I, I saw that as well. So um, we will provide you um, that uh, revised plan. And I know Mr. Osgood uh, will be doing that. Um, number two, with respect to the location of the replication, um, and you suggested moving it onto the other side of the DE wetland series, we did do that. However, we did not provide you a, um, the quantities uh, with respect to our planning schedule. Um, I will tell you that we've asked Maureen uh, Harold from Moss Environmental. She will in fact be providing you a, a planting table which will provide the quantities for each um, species and, and thank you for your markup. We will utilize that as a, as a, as a guide to doing that. And, and Maureen and Ben, again, if I misstate something or if I overstate, uh, please jump in, but I'd, I'd like to respond. Um, hey, please, Doug, just one thing. Excuse just me. one thing, Doug. Uh, this is Ben. Um, Ann Martin probably doesn't even know that um, Mary Rimmer is now on the Conservation Commission for the town of Newberry. So she's no longer working for us. 
And that is why Maureen Harold, Norris Environmental has now taken over the project. Thanks, Ben. I appreciate that. I'm sorry for not uh, mentioning that sooner. Um, uh, your third comment with respect to the uh, proposed 610 feet of replacement, um, wetland replacement, um, to the extent that that is not necessary, uh, we will remove that from the, the plans. And um, I will ask Maureen and Ben to both double check why it was proposed originally but uh, based on a quick conversation with Ben today, um, it, it does appear to be in excess of the requirements. And so we will remove it um, for that reason, as well as your comment that it, if it's unnecessary and it, it's not a good place for it, we shouldn't put it. So uh, that will be removed and we will reflect that on an updated plan. Um, we do need a temporary crossing to get into the large replication area. And so we have asked Maureen to put together a, a means and method documentation that will explain to you what we propose to do in terms of placing matting or protection, traveling and then removing and, and making sure everything is restored or, or you know, corrected on our way out. So we will provide you a written uh, response in that regard. Um, Number five, which talked about uh, what we are proposing for woody plants and seed mix and performance specifications for the uh, 495 square feet of re restoration. Again, uh, and Maureen, sorry to dump everything on you, but Maureen is preparing um, a, a written uh, explanation of that, uh, what we propose to use there as far as woody plants and seed mix and, and the performance specs for that replication. Um, numbers six, seven, and eight, which all apply to the basins, their locations, and you know our ability to pull them back and to uh, actually construct those without having negative impacts on the wetlands. Um, I do know, Anne, that there has been some movement of those basins since uh, the previous review. Uh, what we, what I've asked. Um, then to do at, and and uh, and Maureen as well is that we will highlight those plans for you, provide you maybe clearer distances so that you don't have to scale things, so that we can show you the movements that have occurred in terms of pulling those back. I, I'd love to say we were able to pull them, you know, uh, 20 feet away or 30 feet away, but that is physically impossible. But I do know, again, based on a conversation with Ben, that we've been able to achieve 10 and 15 feet or more in some locations. So allow us an opportunity to provide you a more detailed plan showing those, uh, those movements to those basins. And also, uh, Maureen will be uh, providing you information on uh, those plants uh, and the planting of the slopes and how we feel uh, through what methods we can use to be protective of those wetlands and that also uh, by providing some planting on those slopes, uh, we can um, essentially provide additional protection of the wetlands when we're done. So uh, I, again, I, I'm sorry I can't give you these exact plans and things now, but I'm sure everyone can appreciate that, you know, uh, you know four or five days to do all of that is just uh, not possible in these current times, but we are working on them now. So. This isn't going to be weeks and weeks from now. It'll be uh, relatively quick that you'll receive uh, all of this information. Uh, we will correct the legend with respect to our, um, uh, you know, erosion controls. Uh, as you mentioned, that's a housekeeping uh, action, and, and we apologize for the area error. Um, with re I do want to provide a little more information with respect to the request concerning the. 1.28 acres of land that is, uh, you know, makes up the uh, home lot to the left of the project. And this kind of gets to be, uh, and in some ways, a, a legal technicality. Um, that home and that building lot are not part of the comp comprehensive permit application um, for a number of reasons. But that house, its ownership, its sale uh, is not a component of this comprehensive permit. 
Um, in fact, we are utilizing an easement over some of that property to in fact build the roadway. Um, I am do agree with you that some of the historical filling, which we have uh, essentially taken responsibility for um, uh, providing replication for, uh, you know, was not uh, done by my clients or or uh, any part of our project team, but in proposing the project, um, we have proposed to provide the replication for that. So legally that land is not part of this comprehensive permit process. However, um, you are correct in saying that we are proposing to do work on there that is associated to, with our roadway. Uh, as you know, and as the board knows, uh, we are required um, to file with your conservation commission uh, for an order of conditions to do the work both within the proposed project land as well as that 1.28 acres. So it is our intention that as part of our notice of intent filing, which is uh, near completion, um, the only thing that's waiting, uh, we're waiting on before filing with the conservation commission is we wanted to, um, you know, complete this uh, review uh, with the zoning board and and with um, with Ann, so that it, you know if the results of this analysis and this um, work we're doing now requires us to change something, we want to make sure that that those changes are part of the notice of intent. But for the most part, the notice of intent's ready to go. Uh, just waiting to tweak things. Uh, based on what comes out of these meetings, and then that will be filed um, as early as next week. But it will include, you know, all of the work associated with the 1.28 acre parcel. But again, um, for, for, for a number of reasons, um, it is not technically or legally part of the comprehensive permit application. And, and, and nor do we want it to be. So that's why this sort of that disconnect. But I can assure you, uh, given that we, it will be part of our notice of intent process, the Conservation Commission will have uh, full jurisdiction and authority to review that work and to, to comment on it as part of that process. Um, we are in, in agreement that the Presby uh, systems that we are proposing uh, must be located 100 feet from the vernal pools. Uh, and um, so what we're gonna do is again, uh, tighten uh, our numbers up, uh, show that on a plan that we are in fact outside of the 100 foot uh, buffer zone. And, and we know that we can accomplish that. Um, I do understand that there is a, 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 you know, a legal definition on how they measure the Presby systems and the sand associated with it for purposes of that 100 feet. So we've asked Ben to you know, do that calculation and reflect it on a plan. But um, I've been assured that we can meet that 100 foot setback uh, from, our, uh, from the vernal pool with our Presby uh, systems. Um, Comment 13, I agree, is a repeat of nine. So um, we will be addressing that uh, as part of our updated plans to you. And then um, I do want to fill you in. Let's see, comment 14, which was uh, regarding the, uh, the pond and why it's a wet pond. And, and I, again, um, Mr. Chairman and, and Ann, we do propose to provide all of this in writing, but perhaps if Ben could take a minute to provide some uh, insight as to why uh, that pond uh, is being proposed as a, as a wet pond and why it needs to be. Uh, ben, you, you can yep. do that. Yeah, so we have to provide stormwater treatment. The first flush of stormwater has to be treated and there's different ways to do that. Um, this is a perfect place to put a pond. There's a low area on the, I guess that would be the southeast side of the roadway as it goes in and has a high water table. Um, so we've decided to design a stormwater treatment wetland um, in that location. We don't, our other treatment systems are 
infiltration based. Basically, we infiltrate water into the ground underneath our storage systems, which are buried. Um, this system here is um, it's an open basin because the that area is created um, with filling the roadway. There's a low area there, um, but I will say we we discharge that water well below the vernal pool. The ver vernal pool is about 400 feet away and it's on the other side of a roadway. Um, and there are no direct pipe connections between our pond and the, the wetland other than the outlet structure, which, you know, has, it's a, has a vertical pipe inside. So it'll be very hard for any kind of, um, you know, endangered species to travel up the pipe and get through the small orifices that are in that vertical pipe uh, at the outlet. So um, I, the stormwater, I, I looked at the stormwater regulations today. It says, do not put it near a vernal pool. The technical uh, requirement is that we cannot be within 100 feet. So I guess, uh, what is the definition of near? Um, I guess that's what it boils down to. So, um, you know, I did, you do refer to the Wetland Protection Act. I looked at it briefly today. Um, I didn't, it says we can't impact habitat, uh, but I, I just, in our opinion, in my opinion, for what it's worth, I don't know that that pond is going to attract the vernal pool species, especially considering that the vernal pool small area is on our property, um, probably 10 times more is on the Martin Burns property, um, which is a thousand acres of open area. And of course, there's always a chance that some sort of a species is going to trap. They're not, they're not going to look at a road and say, I'm not going to go there. But I think the um, we're downstream far enough away that it's not going to be a, a problem. Thanks, Ben. Um, the final set of comments um, are with respect to the uh, proposed donation of just under a five acre parcel to fish, fish and game, and as well as the proposed trail. I, I have to express my um, frustration, if you will. Um, Mr. Erickson had you know, probably a year ago or at the onset of this project reached out to uh, Ann Gagnon uh, at, at Fisheries and Wildlife to, to discuss the potential donation of the property. Um, we have, you know, it was our understanding given its proximity to the wildlife management area that it might be a piece of property um, attractive to the fisheries and wildlife. And, and certainly it, it was intended always to be a donation um, and, and, and again, in my experience, that has been well received. Um, Ms. Gagnon passed us on to Pat Huckery, um, suggesting that we should work with Pat on this. Um, Mr. Erickson reached out to her on numerous occasions, um, was not, did not receive any responses, uh, despite calls and emails. He then asked me to pick up the, um, the effort and I will tell you that I too have made uh, a number of email requests to both Ann and Pat Huckery, Ann Gagnon and Pat Huckery, uh, as well as a call and, and left a message. Um, quite frankly, we're just not getting any response, which you know I can only assume means uh, they are not interested uh, in accepting that property. Um, and again, it. it, it, it it befuddles me why, but nevertheless, um, my client at this point is a, a, of the mindset that if uh, the Town Conservation Commission would like to take control of it or some other environmental group, um, we would be happy to donate it. On the other hand, if there are no takers, uh, we will just integrate it into the uh, you know, ownership of the open space by the homeowners association, and it will remain 
you know, untouched, undeveloped, and, and part of the homeowners association. So at this point, um, that's our answer. It, it appears that fisheries and wildlife uh, is not interested. And so we, uh, you know, we will just uh, preserve it in another way. Um, with respect to the proposed trail, um, that was an effort on my client's part, thinking that it would be a beneficial amenity, not only to our residents in the new project, but also um, our, the neighboring uh, homeowners on Pearson in that they could uh, come down our road into our project and then access that trailway into the um, wildlife management area. Uh, it was done solely as a, an effort to provide an amenity to the neighborhood. Um, it was discussed, I believe, Mr. Erickson can correct me if I'm wrong, but it was mentioned during the early um, discussions with uh, Ann Gagnon and, uh, regarding the donated land. Um, and again, uh, we did not receive any input or uh, one way or another, whether it was something that they would like or not like. And so at this point, um, we, we will certainly be happy to just remove, if, if the board and or the town or actually fishes and wildlife does not want to see that trail, um, we're happy to remove it. Um, again, it was an attempt to provide, um, you know, an access to that amazing uh, wildlife management area. So um, we, we would be happy to take that or we would be willing, I should say, to take that trail uh, off the plan if, if that's the uh, board's desire. So um, those are, are the quick answers to the questions that have been raised. Again, we will provide written um, responses as well as amendments to the plans, charts, and, and other things that I've committed to today. And um, Ben, Maureen, um, am I out of line saying that those things will probably evolve over the next couple of weeks? Definitely. No, nope, we will provide the information. All right, well, thank you. Mr. Chairman, that's our response at this point to uh, Ann's uh, memo. And again, I'd like to thank her for that effort. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, Eric, do you have any comments or questions on uh, the presentation or the responses? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, I think um, questions or comments. Let's see. So uh, I had asked previously about a landscaping plan to see that as um, and I think the landscaping that was talked about today was about wetlands and, and replication, but I'm looking for a landscape plan of the overall project so that we, we can see where plants um, are in relation to the houses and the drives and snow clearing. I had some other questions uh, previously that I don't think were addressed. And so this time I'll put them in writing and send them through Susan and, and send them along. But um, had asked about a sequence of building in terms of what's the order of grading and infrastructure roadways and then homes and what's the sequence of the homes understanding sales and the order of, of how the homes and where the um, supplemented homes would be. Um, I had asked about a market study or comps for this type of development in the Newbury and surrounding communities to see if there was anything like this that had houses that were placed this close together on a parcel such as this. Um, I'd like to add to that if, if the applicant has done any market studies or reached out to any real estate brokers and, and has gotten any market feedback about the saleability of the homes, um, particularly just the placement of the homes, the, the minimum 15 feet between the homes, homes that are aligned parallel to each other, make a particularly unpleasant 15 feet between houses and depending on sun orientation, I'm not sure what would grow in there. Um, and the fact that if you have windows or mirroring houses, whether the, the units will be looking into each other. Um, they'd asked about a draft uh, homeowners association document, the draft of any covenants of rules and regulations. Um, be interested to know about uh, 
people in Newbury are fairly close to the ocean. Is it going to be boat parking or storage on site? Is that going to be allowed? Um, things like that nature. It asked about renderings about the intended streetscape. I know there's a rendering of each home and plans of the home, but it'd be interesting if someone actually put this together and did a rendering of what they think the community or the, the drive uh, would look like in terms of understanding that compared to the one acre lots uh, in Newbury. Uh, there are some inconsistency in the current building plans in terms of uh, some of the elevations and the plans, windows don't match and align. Uh, we'd asked about solar. I think the response was is that it would be, a, um, you know, obviously an approved, a code approved program, but it'd be interesting to see where the solar panels are, are placed. Um, solar sounds great, but not sure all the houses have the right orientation for it. Uh, and then the path to the fish uh, and wildlife property, is it assumed that people using the fish and wildlife property can park in the parking spaces on site? Or is this just a walking token walking path to, to point A to point B that, that people really can't get to because they can't drive? If, um, so I'd like to understand as part of the path and part of the donation where the, the parking would be for um, the sometimes nature walker and the sometimes hunters that show up to use that, use that path to access that land. So those are 12 comments. A few of them are new. Some of them are recapped. And as I said, Mr. Chairman, I'll put these in writing this time to, to send them out. Uh, Mr. Ch Mr. Chairman, if I could respond. Uh, Mr. Swan, I, 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 I do want to say that um, I did submit earlier this week a, a response to, um, I believe, each of the questions you raised tonight. You had mentioned at the last meeting that you had a number of questions that we hadn't responded to. So I, I, I went back and I read the meeting notes from the last two meetings and, and put together the list of, of questions that you had provided to us. I, I do apologize. I was, um, I, I was out of work last week for, for medical reasons. And um, I, so I was a little late in, in putting together that, but um, you should, you, the, the, um, I have submitted to the board uh, earlier this week, uh, a written response to all of those questions. I provided you some updated um, planting plans with uh, tree, um, you know, the, the planting listing of what's proposed. Um, we are working on putting together a, um, some renderings for you of the actual plantings proposed for the individual houses. And I did give you a colored plan overview of the streetscape. Again, I'm sorry for my delay in getting that to you. Um, I, I did provide, uh, well, without taking up the board's time, I, I, will, uh, I will just say that um, I did, in fact, um, respond to all, most of those questions. There is a draft homeowners uh, association document supplied. Uh, we don't usually do those this early in the game. Uh, we, we generally wait until we see if we get a permit and then we take all of the conditions in that permit and integrate them. But we did um, make the effort of providing you a draft homeowners association. Uh, we believe hopefully addressing your concerns, but please understand it is a document in process and to the extent the, the board and you, yourself and the board provide us um, some specifics that you'd like to see, we will certainly add them. But there is a document in that package for you to review. Um, um, I'm not sure, um, I, I did not provide you a sequence of the construction and building. Uh, we can do that very easily. What I did provide to you is an understanding of the proposed affordable units and where they are proposed to be located and how they would be built in accordance to the overall schedule, meaning, you know, we, we typically have to build one affordable for each three market rates that we build so that, you know, one of the first four will be affordable, one of the two of the first eight, three of the first 12, et cetera. Um, I will tell you that we have given you, I have given you the proposed uh, locations of the affordables. 
but it will be ultimately mass housing uh, when we do the um, when we start working on the um, the documents with them in, in terms of the restrictive uh, covenants and things they will tell us if the units we've proposed and the location are acceptable as you know they like to see them spread out which we've done but again um, I've given you our proposal we'll we'll both have to wait and see what mass housing housing says during the development of the regulatory um, I've given you um, some information on the um, a little more information on the solar uh, uh, proposed solar panels I provided you a uh, rendering of one of the houses showing uh, the design of the uh, solar panels and how they would sit on that house. Um, understand that with the different orientations of the homes and whatnot, you know, each one will have a separate, different, somewhat different design as required. However, we are planning on putting um, those solar panels on all the homes. Uh, we have contracted with Boston Solar, which is a well-respected and, and, you know, uh, a lot of experienced company. Uh, they will be designing the individual systems, and that'll be done, of course, according to, you know, the codes that are required, and that will be run through your building uh, department as well. So we, I did give you some. So, I, I, again, I, 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 I believe... I've done a pretty good job of getting most of those questions answered. Um, I, I am waiting on that rendering of the individual house landscaping. Uh, and I will now that you've again, and I thank you uh, given me an indication of, of what your questions were. I will make sure that um, to the extent I haven't answered or provided you what you've asked for, I, I will double check against this list and, and you will have it in the, in the next week or so. Hey, Mr. Duchesne, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I would ask that we, we put a discussion of the architecture and the, um, you know, covering the questions of, of uh, we move on, not move on from site, but add uh, to the agenda, the discussion of, you know, what type of community this is going to be and what um, some of the things that we'd like to understand about it per the questions that I asked. Okay, so you're, you're asking that we do that at the next meeting i would yeah i would like to yeah i would like to get i'd like to start with those questions and start the discussion on the architecture of the okay that's, project that's fine that's fine thank you okay you're welcome uh mario any uh comments or questions from you hold on within the 100 foot uh, wetlands buffer, is that, is that appropriate? Um, who are you I asking? Hear your total Martin. question. Ann Martin? Uh, ask your question again. Oh, I'm sorry. A few of the lots are within the 100 foot wetlands buffer. Is, is that appropriate? Um, there is nothing in the Wetlands Protection Act that says is that the house lots cannot be in the 100 foot buffer. That's it. Okay, thank you. Chairman, I have two quick comments I'd like to make in response to their response to me, if I could. Sure, go right ahead. I was gonna ask you next, but anyways. Okay, um, as far as the whole uh, discussion about the 1.2 acre lot, um, I'm gonna leave that to Adam Costa. If he says it makes sense or the, the board's council says it makes sense, then I'm gonna presume that it does um, and let it sit there. My concern is that any approval that the board issues, regardless of the commission's approval, fully covers all of the work that's being proposed. Um, and I saw work on that lot. I'm not caught up in the easements and you certainly don't need to take me through all of that. I'll just trust that someone else is gonna handle that. Um, and when you were talking earlier, I was looking at the plans and looking at sheet uh, 11 that shows the Presby system. And I noticed that there is a gazebo and a playground that sits on top of where the septic system is and overlaps the Presby system. And so 
when Ben is looking at making adjustments to that to make sure it's far enough away from the vernal pool, I would suggest that it might also be important to provide the zoning board with a detail that shows what that gazebo is going to sit on and what the playground is going to sit on and make sure there's enough clearance between the top of the Presby system and whatever, you know, structural footprint and undergirding is needed for the gazebo or the playground to make sure that they can actually fit in that location while you're looking at all that. That's all, that's all I have right now. Okay, maybe, Ann, I just have a quick question for you without going into a lot of detail if you can help. What is a Presby system? What, what exactly does that do? Okay. Uh, I'm gonna let Ben answer that question. It's basically, I mean, I'm a wetland scientist. I don't design. Okay, but well, Ben is, if he's better suited, I, I just like to have some idea of what you guys are talking about. Yep, yep, take it away, Ben. All right. So a typical septic system that everybody remembers are four inch pipes set in stone. The bed of stone with four inch pipes and the effluents distributed over it. Um, over the last 15, 20 years, there are a lot of different types of systems based on the science of septic effluent treatment, Presby being one of them. So Presby is a system of tubes. They look like 12 inch diameter drain pipes. They're wrapped with filter fabric. They have some special features about how they're made um, and it provides an enhanced treatment above what just a typical pipe and stone will provide. Um, they're approved by the state of Massachusetts. They're called an alternative system and there are guidelines on how to install them, how to design them. And, you know, so that it's just, it's an alternative system that we've decided to use. It takes up a little less room than a conventional system. Um, our conventional system was very large and we use that system to prove that we can use a conventional system. And then we cut down the required area using one of these innovative alternative systems. Um, it's tubes set in what they call C33 sand, which is a very coarse sand. Um, and I honestly can understand Anne's question about the 100 feet um, you know, and we'll provide some additional details. The, the tubes and the system sand have to be 100 feet. And it's the, the edge of the system sand is 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 defined as the edge of the leach field, um, you know, the more common term. What we've shaded is the edge of the sand fill because around that there's some sand, Title V sand around the outside, but that's not considered the leach field. So we'll make that correction to make it easier to see that it's 100 feet away. Um, and I should also note the Board of Health is reviewing this. I talked to Deb Rogers this week. She had a couple of questions about the design, I'm working through that with her. Um, the one thing about these systems, they require somebody to maintain them. So we have to have a contract. Um, somebody has to take a look at it every six months. They have to be basically a level two wastewater treatment licensed person in the state of Massachusetts um, that inspects these every six months to make sure they're working. So these types of systems get more oversight, more inspection. Uh, they work better. They provide a better effluent. So that they're, they're generally a better system. And if we built a pipe and stone system, we could put it in the ground and everybody would forget about it. Uh, the Presby is going to have a maintenance contract. So it, it's actually a better system when you're talking about a, uh, you know, multi-tenant, um, multi-unit system. It's going to have some maintenance, some oversight. They have to submit the reports to the town. But it's it's just it's a new type of system. There are many different kinds. Uh, we chose to use this type, but there are not all of them are like this. There's there's all kinds of different types of innovative systems. Okay, thank you. I know probably just enough. 
<laughs> I don't want to get too, it can be no, very that's boring. Right, right, right. You did uh, great, Ben. Thank you. Okay, Anne, are you all through with your questions? I am, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so I think we can go on to public comment now. Uh, questions or comments? Just give everybody a few minutes, I guess. I don't see anybody has raised a hand at the moment. So anybody who does have questions, if you could please raise your hand and we will take them in the order of which um, they appear. Okay, it looks like we have a question from Peter Frango. So I'm going to unmute him, ask him to unmute. There we go. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I have a question. I know it was addressed in the previous application uh, by Field of the States regarding the uh, water pressure. And I know that the, a comment was made recently that appropriate tests were done recently and they said that the pressure was adequate. However, uh, there's been a change in, I guess, most of the housing and education environment that people are working from home people are educating their children from home. So the traditional hours of water use when the test was done the first time, which I think was about nine o'clock, uh, doesn't really apply because most people are up earlier between six and nine. In the previous test, it was done on a school day. Most of the kids are gone to school by then. So I guess, is the water test gonna be rescheduled and it will be rescheduled for a time that is reasonable to normal family household water use. That's a lot of units. We already have low pressure. We haven't seen any improvement in the pressure and obviously it's not gonna get better with 24 more units. Thank you. Okay, so uh, we don't have Paul Colby from Highfield Water with us tonight. Uh, and I'm just trying to look back and maybe somebody else uh, has this, but when the flow test was done most recently, does anybody yeah, he, have it? He did send us the results. Um, I want to say it was September, but... Uh, was it September 11th maybe? Because I, I think that's what the all I have is the flow test 9-11, so... Yeah, I think that's what it was, yeah. Right, I believe the results, they're 1,000 gallons per minute, I think at a 40-pound uh, residual pressure. 60. So basically, they do the test. They open up a fire hydrant, 1,000 gallons per minute comes out of the fire hydrant, and there's still a residual pressure of 40 pounds. The, um, the, the, the pressure just in the main, the static pressure, they call it, when there's no huge load is... 80 PSI, um, you know, which is more than adequate. 40 PSI is where you want your house to be at. You don't really want it too much more than that or else you start blowing valves. 80 PSI is the static pressure um, that's in those pipes, which is more than enough. And, and Ben, do you recall when those tests were done, the recent set of tests? They were just done a little bit prior to the previous meeting. I think they were done in September, August, September. Right. I, I think it's September 11th. Yeah. September yeah. 11th. Thank you. Okay. Uh, uh, do you want another question? Sure. Okay. Dan Linden, let me just find you. There you are. Okay, there you go. Thanks. Uh, yeah, I was curious about uh, wetland buffers. So a lot of towns will have bylaws that address wetland buffers that go beyond the Wetland Protection Act. So I'm wondering if Anne can speak to what she knows about surrounding towns. Not sure if Byfield and Newberry has a bylaw like that. Maybe they do. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm wondering what, what other towns are, are using for a buffer. Thanks. Well, 
Um, it varies from town to town and municipality to municipality. I guess as a general rule of thumb for towns that have wetland bylaws, they tend to have a 25 foot no disturb and a 50 foot no structure is fairly popular. If that answers your question. Um, I don't, Newberry does have a, they do have a bylaw, don't they? Yeah, it's just for Plum Island though. Right, they have a bylaw, but it only applies to Plum Island. So it wouldn't apply to this project. If they had a bylaw that did apply to this project, that bylaw would be implemented by the zoning board. Okay. So the only wetlands protection that applies to this would be under the Wetlands Protection Act. Okay, does that answer your question, Dan? Okay. All right, yeah, and I, I just to follow up to it, I had another question about um, there's a vernal pool that's the applicant said is, you know, more than 100 feet from this open retention pond that's going to be built. But it's also on the other side of the road um, that's going to be created by the development, which means it's pinched between the development and Pearson Drive, right? So um, I know the answer to this question because I'm, I'm actually a wildlife biologist. I studied vernal pools in, in undergrad at University of Rhode Island. Um, but I'm just wondering about the fate of that vernal pool and what kind of habitat it's going to serve when there's no upland uh, around it, essentially, just to, to allow animals to move through it to even use it. They were going to so, ask you, Ian. <laughs> you're asking about the vernal, well, the potential vernal pool that is present on the site. Is that correct, Dan? He muted himself again. Hold on. I just want to make sure I, I'm... I'll, I'll try not to mute myself again. So yeah, uh, yeah it's mute. the one on the south. Um, let's see, it says wetland there. I'm looking at page, if you look at sheet 11, I'm not sure it's identified. It says wetland area, 23,000 square feet. Um, it's in the bottom left of the diagram on sheet 11 which corresponds to the southwest of the part of the project between Pearson Drive? Yes, okay. That, that was an area that was, un, it, there was a lot of contention last time around because there's evidence that that area supports water at some, in some years. Of course, you know, you have dry years, you have wet years. Sometimes it's a better habitat, sometimes it's not so, not so good. Um, but this, I'm just curious, I didn't really hear anything addressing that area and what, what this project would mean for it. Okay, I just wanted to make sure that that's the area that you were talking about before I addressed it. You are correct that vernal pool species, I believe wood frog, have been observed breeding in there. And uh, Mary Rimmer submitted her data to Natural Heritage because of the shallowness of that pool, and I guess because the data was only collected from one year, Natural Heritage did not accept that data uh, for certification of that pool. And so when it was Byfield Estates, the Byfield Estates applicant made a commitment early on in that process, because I had pressed this issue about it being certified, that they would protected as a vernal pool, they would maintain the setbacks, even though it was not a certified vernal pool and it was a potential vernal pool. And as I think everyone on the call knows, Byfield's estate went by the wayside. There is a new applicant. This new applicant has not made that commitment and has not been willing to protect that area uh, at the way you would a certified vernal pool. And to my knowledge, no additional data or surveys have been done out there or on the portion of that wetland system that extends offsite into whoever's backyard that is to supplement the data to natural heritage to take another shot. So right now it's a potential vernal pool. It has functioned in some years 
as a vernal pool and provided breeding habitat, but Natural Heritage didn't certify it. And that ties the hands under the Wetlands Protection Act of the Convention and the Zoning Board of really having any teeth to ensure protection of that. So you are correct that surrounding it the way it is now will significantly impact the breeding activity that occurs there to the extent that it does by um, fertile pool species. Thanks, Ann. I, and so, you know, just to reiterate, um, when we have these conversations about mitigation for vernal pool habitat, um, I, I feel like a lot of it's nonsense, right? Because we're, we're, we're chipping away at little tiny things, not addressing big things. And so um, I just, frankly, I, again, I said I'm a wildlife biologist. I care about the environment here. And this is probably the smallest issue in, in terms of this whole project. Um, because technically, yeah, there's no, there's no bylaws. There's nothing wrong with how the project's being built according to law, but that doesn't change what it's doing to the environment, how it's impacting the land. Thanks. Mr. Chairman, can I just, uh, make a comment about the vernal pool that he's talking about or the, sure. Sure it is. so Mary Rimmer did apply to natural heritage. I think she applied twice. Um, the first time she applied, they turned her down so that needed more information. The next year we went back and took a look at it. We uh, took a look at it the year after that as well. She has been going out. She did go out there. Made an application last fall. The EP turned it down and said, um, and the reason was observations were during the month of May that the pool was dry. And again, this year it was dry. Um, and they said it just didn't have the, I think they called it the hydraulic retention time to be a true vernal pool, that it may hold water at times, but it's really not a true vernal pool. And that was the latest determination. I can get that information to Ann. Um, she can re review that, but, you know, Mary did take a look at it. Um, we did still respect that area. Um, it is an isolated land subject to flooding. It is not a jurisdictional wetlands, but we did, we worked down close to the edge of that wetlands, but we did respect that area. We're not filling it, it's there. So it will still act to collect water and pond and be a potential breeding spot for whatever, uh, but it is not, does not qualify to be a certified vernal pool. Okay, thank you. So do we have anyone else? We do not. Okay. Well, uh, I'd like to ask uh, Adam uh, about the 1.2 acre house that uh, Ann is concerned about not being uh, part of this project if he could. I'd be happy to, uh, Mr. Chairman. So um, the, the standard for making application both to the, the project subsidy, in this case, mass housing, and then subsequently to the Zoning Board of Appeals is that an applicant has to have site control. I'm sure that uh, the board members have heard that, that term used before. And site control comes in different forms. Uh, some applicants for comprehensive permits have purchase and sale agreements with a right to acquire the property upon the completion of the permitting process. Other applicants have uh, acquired title already. They, they own the site. Um, with respect to certain components of the project, sometimes those components are located on portions of the site that are owned or will be owned uh, in what we call as attorneys fee simple. In other words, you, the, the developer owns the actual earth, owns the project the same way that you or I might own our, our home and the property that surrounds it. And other times an applicant will have an easement interest over um, nearby property for let's say utilities or portions of roadways even, uh, stormwater uh, structures, drainage structures. Um, there may be grading easements required for uh, driveways. 
And all of those components don't necessarily need to be within the four corners of the property that will be owned outright by the applicant. But the applicant certainly has to have a sufficient title interest in the land so that it can make an application to the board, ultimately the project subsidy for final approval, and can do what needs to be done to develop the site in accordance with whatever permit might issue. So that's sort of my long-winded way of saying, I don't have an objection in concept and I don't have the exact plan before me at the moment, but I don't have an objection in concept to the separation out of a 1.2 acre parcel of property with a home on it and excluding that home and that surrounding property from the quote unquote project site that is before the board that is the subject of this application. But if there are components of the project, uh, I heard a reference made by, uh, by, by, by Anne, I think it was to um, maybe the entrance driveway or roadway portions of it being on the 1.2 acre parcel. I heard a reference to uh, certain areas, um, and this is less concerning to me, but certain areas of historic fill being on the 1.2 acre parcel. If there are components of this project, again, less so the historic fill, but certainly the driveway, the, the, the roadway, the access to these homes that is within the 1.2 acre parcel, the applicant has to establish for this board that it has sufficient site control over that piece. And that could be in the form of an easement, but the easement needs to be broad enough so that if the board were to say, we want sidewalks along that stretch of roadway. We want the roadway widened. We want landscaping. We want certain grading that the applicant has the ability to provide that in connection with the project. My guess is that attorney DeShane is gonna tell us that he's got all that and that's fine. And as long as he can submit adequate documentation to that effect, uh, I think the project and the application can proceed. But certainly the applicant has to have the authority to do what the board demands with respect to any component of the project whether it's on land that is outright owned by the applicant or it's on land over which the applicant has an easement. Okay, thank you. Uh, Attorney DeShane, do you want to respond to that? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman and, and Ms. Uh, Attorney Coster is correct. Um, I, we do have uh, sufficient site control um, we, in fact, have, uh, you know, through easements and, and other legal documents, have the ability to, in fact, uh, uh, place things within those easement areas should the board require them. Um, and I will be happy to forward all of that written evidence of, of site control to Attorney Costa uh, as soon as possible. Okay, thank you. All right. Uh... Eric, is there anything else you want to cover tonight? Uh, no. Uh, no, 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 Mr. Chairman. Mario, anything you uh, want to uh, bring up? Nothing from me, Mr. Chairman. Okay. I'll say. All right. So uh, it's my understanding that Eric's questions have been or will be answered in a timely fashion before the next scheduled meeting, which we will uh, uh, discuss next. Uh, and is there anything else that we want to uh, have on the agenda next next time? Eric, uh, Mr. Or, Chairman, if I may, yes, um, I do want to report to the board as well with respect to our uh, engineering peer review um, uh, from Mr. Sawatka. Um, his, his final, his last letter uh, had six questions or, or indicated six concerns. Um, we have um, submitted uh, a written response to those. Um, and so I do suspect or hope that Mr. Sawatka will be providing to the board sort of a final peer review letter indicating that we have in fact responded to his final uh, six comments. They were relatively minor, you know, uh, final tweaks that he wanted. So um, I, I would I would hope that he will get that and perhaps that 
we could at least, um, uh, you know, represent at the next meeting that he is uh, final in his uh, in his review. Uh, we will be prepared and to uh, discuss um, the topics that Mr. Svan has uh, raised. And um, at this point, we would like to know if there's anything else the board would like us to prepare for or to provide to the board with respect to information for that next meeting. Uh, well, we, I'm gonna assume that before the next meeting that you will respond to Ann Martin's uh, yes. questions. So maybe we can uh, review that also at that time. Right, thank you. Okay. So, uh, so what's our uh, options for meeting nights in November? Okay, so one moment. So our, our, our regularly scheduled meeting was set for the 19th of November, which is the third Thursday. So the right. following Thursday is Thanksgiving. Okay. So um, if we went the week earlier, it's possible that the applicant and our peer reviewers would be prepared to participate. Um, that would make it the 12th, unless you wanted to push it out to the week after that. That's really up to the board, which would mean say December 3rd. Um, I, I apologize, but I am not available the 12th of November. Okay. so. Uh, our next option would be December 3rd. Anne, are you available? I am available. Okay. I can check with Joe tomorrow um, so we can um, propose that and I can solidify it with him tomorrow. I, I suspect it's probably not to be an issue. Um, Mario, are you available? Uh, yes, I am. Okay, and Eric is? Yes. I am, so. Okay, and I assume somebody from MTC can be as well, Adam? Okay. Yes, I'm available. Either, either Lisa or I will be in attendance. Okay. All right, and how about um, Doug and Ben and company for the applicant? Does that work out for you? I'm available. Okay. Yes. Okay. So it sounds like December 3rd it is. Okay, so uh, can we have a motion? Can we have a motion to continue this hearing until December 3rd? Sure, I'll make a motion to continue the hearing until December 3rd. Okay, do we have a second? Second the motion. Okay, Eric? Yes. yes. Mario? Yes. And I vote yes. So meeting will be continued to December 3rd. Mr. Okay. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. Oh, yes, Adam. Uh, I, I might just suggest, and this isn't a great concern of mine, but I might just suggest that you get confirmation from the applicant in writing and, and maybe Susan, this was her intention anyway, of an extension at least, you know, so beyond that date. Um, typically, in the usual context, you'd ask for extensions from meeting to meeting just to be sure all deadlines are being satisfied because of the COVID-19 orders that are still in effect. Uh, there, there really is no constructive approval. There, there is some, some um, there are some murmurings out there that there may be a conclusion to the deadlines, uh, the, the open-ended deadlines under the orders and as the end of the calendar year, but none of that has sort of come to fruition yet. But I would, I would just suggest that you get in writing an extension beyond that date. So we don't have any, any, any issues. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if I could comment to that and also um, with all due respect, my, my client is, uh, has just uh, communicated with me that, um, uh, you know, he, he, his feeling is that December 3rd is, um, you know, too far out. Um, 
did that was there a reason i know the board meets on november 19th was there a reason why that day wasn't available for us we have a pretty full agenda well, already that evening <laughs> okay all right thank you and, and then the following week is um i understand is thanksgiving does the board would the board consider perhaps meeting uh, that week um on another night um, what's your feeling on that, uh, members, meaning Eric, Finn, Mario, and Sue? I'll be out of town that week. Okay. Well, all right. Well, thank you. I appreciate the consideration. Um, and what we will do then, Mr. Chairman, is that we will make sure that all of the information is provided to the board. Perhaps we, that will give us plenty of time to um, make sure everything is completed with Mr. Swatka. It'll give us an opportunity to make sure that we've addressed and discussed all issues with Anne, so that at that meeting, hopefully the reports can be that all of the issues have been addressed and, and, and we can move forward from there. Thank you. Okay. And Mr. Are you Mr. Desch well, Mr. Deshaines, what I'm gonna do is probably call you next week and just confirm receipt of the items that I received an email and forwarded to the board that you sent this week, just to make sure that we're on the same page. Sure, and, and okay, Mr. Uh, Attorney Costa will provide you um, uh, whatever you need in terms of extensions or, or or anything of that type. Thank you. All right. Okay, then. Uh, anything else from anybody? If not, uh, I'd, I'd... No. Okay, I'd like to have a motion to adjourn the meeting. I'll make a motion to adjourn the meeting. Second that motion. Okay. Uh, all in favor, Eric? Yes. Mario? Yes. And I vote yes. So the meeting is adjourned. Thank you for your time, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.